Hi there. So previously we talked about all kinds of advanced microscopies and now I want to talk to you about some other characterization methods that are used in nanoscience and nanotechnology. Um, but first it's kind of fun to uh, talk about something that's used in a wide variety of characterizations, uh, piezoelectric materials. And I think this will help you understand not only some of the things that we're going to talk about today about quartz crystal microbalances, but also about the uh, control mechanisms for moving the cantilevers um, in atomic force microscopy and for moving the tips up and down in scanning tunneling microscopy as well as a wide array of other applications. So a piezoelectric material <clears throat> is a material that generates a voltage or an electric charge in response to an applied stress or vice versa. If you apply a stress, it can, um, or if a voltage is applied, it can deform the crystal. So either way. Um, in some crystalline structures, what happens is if you apply a voltage, you can displace the center of mass of the positive charges from the center of the mass of the negative charges. And that's shown over here in this little cartoon. It shows you a crystal um, with a, an interchanging positive and negative ion in the lattice that you oftentimes find in um, crystalline structures or ceramics. And then um, in the presence of uh, zero voltage or zero electric field, the center of mass for the positive charges and the center of mass for the negative charges line up so that the symmetry is in the same place. But then if the crystal is stretched or deformed in some way, then that center of mass for the positive charges and the center of mass for the negative charges can displace from one another. Okay, Or if you apply a voltage, then you can get the center of masses to move apart, vice versa. All right. So that's what happens in a piezoelectric material. And piezo actually comes from the Greek, a Greek word which means push. Um, so what they can do is to act as a transducer between electrical and mechanical oscillation. So if you apply an alternating voltage or field, then that can cause a mechanical oscillation um, in your piezoelectric material. Okay, and that's what happens in atomic force microscopy in tapping mode. You're applying an alternating voltage, and then that causes your piezoelectric material to vibrate, which moves your cantilever up and down in tapping mode AFM. So other uses of piezoelectric materials, there's piezoelectric elements in some lighters uh, where you have a mechanical shock from flicking the lighter that's used and converted to electricity to make the spark. Um, uh, AFM and STM motion, I already kind of talked about that and how that's used for fine control, fine motion of uh, the tip or cantilever. It can also be used to make a buzzer. Of course, if you make a mechanical oscillation, that can make a sound. And so you can make buzzers. It can be used to make speakers. And it was also used, um, if you're familiar with the company Quartz watches, uh, they were used as timing elements in watches because if you apply an alternating voltage um, to your piezoelectric material, then that can cause the uh, crystal to oscillate. And of course, uh, what they tend to do, because this is how oscillators work, is they want to oscillate right at their resonant frequency. And so you cut and shape your material and then hit it with um, an alternating current and then it'll oscillate and it will choose the highest oscillation for that frequency which matches the resonant frequency of the crystal. Mm -hmm. And they can be used to make excellent timing devices with good precision. And that was the watch. Now, that same idea though of applying an alternating voltage and then having the crystal cut to oscillate at a certain resonant frequency, that's the idea behind a quartz crystal microbalance or QCM for short. So these QCMs, they're thin crystals, or thin cuts of crystalline material with a quartz piezoelectric material, material, and they have resonant frequencies that range from 600 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, depending upon how big they are, how thick they are, and they're cut. Okay. What they can be used for, it's a microbalance, right? We all understand from introductory physics that the mass is proportional to the resonant frequency for your oscillating system. For example, for a simple harmonic oscillator, your uh, angular frequency omega is equal to the square root of k over m, where k is your spring constant and m is the mass attached to the spring. Okay. While the relationship is more complex for a QCM mathematically, the idea is very similar, that the mass that you put on the surface of your QCM here can cause the frequency to shift. Okay. 
Now, for a quartz crystal microbalance, that frequency shift for an applied mass to the electrode is given by an equation known as the Sauerbrie equation, okay? So here, the frequency shift is proportional to the mass uptake on the crystalline surface. Delta F is the frequency shift divided by the resonant frequency of the oscillator F squared. And then that's equal to minus 2 times the change in the mass, the mass that's added to the oscillator, delta M, divided by A, the area, the active area of your QCM electrode, divided by rho Q, which is the density of quartz, which is 2.648. Uh, grams per cubic centimeter, and divided by the acoustic speed of sound um, in the uh, resonator VQ, which for quartz is 3.34 times 10 to the fifth centimeters per second. Okay. Now you can take those numbers and group them into a constant out front, minus 2.26 times 10 to the sixth, and then it's delta M over A. A depends upon the geometry of your QCM, of course, the active area, and delta M is the mass uptake. Now the nice thing is that if you have resonators with a high frequency, high resonant frequency like you do for QCM, 600 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, then the frequency shifts um, can be a reasonable size for a very small mass uptake. And so what these things can do is, let's say that you put them inside a vacuum chamber and you expose your resonator to a thin film. Okay, that thin film can be adsorbed through vapor within that you introduce into the vacuum chamber, or it can be used to determine the film thickness of something where you're depositing a film on purpose through uh, thermal evaporation, say of a metal source from below that then goes up and adds onto your QCM. Okay. So they're used as microscale weighing devices um, and also to figure out what the thickness of a thin film is, which is useful in nanotechnology and nanoscience, things like that. I actually used these devices in doing my PhD studies. So this is a frequency shift versus pressure of an introduced gas experiment that I did within my vacuum chamber. And I had an electrode for my QCM that was copper, okay, copper 111, which is just a certain crystalline face of copper. And I was adsorbing methanol onto the face, and I was monitoring the frequency of shift. Now, because I knew the uh, density of the film that I was going to put down, then I knew uh, what the frequency shift should be for one monolayer of that film. And so I saw that there, here's my first monolayer of methanol going down in that step, and there's my second monolayer of methanol going down on that step. So I knew exactly how many layers, atomically thick layers of methanol I was putting down. And one layer corresponded to about 10 hertz shift, so it's a very reasonable frequency shift to want to monitor for such a small mass of uh, film. Okay. So QCMs are very sensitive to small changes in mass, which makes them really useful in nanotechnology studies. Now, most of the ones that you would buy for nanoscience nanotechnology are something called AT cut, which is just a certain angle that you cut through the quartz crystal at. And they're cut so that they op uh, operate in transverse shear mode. And all that means is that you have this thin disc. You saw the pictures, right? And then on either side of that thin disc of quartz is an electrode that's used to apply the alternating voltage. And when you apply that alternating voltage, the QCM oscillates like this, okay? Um, as shown in the cartoon here, the top face moves, say, to the right. The bottom face moves to the left. And that's called transverse shear mode, which is really good for measuring um, nanoscale films. So that's a QCM, and it's oftentimes used especially in thin film studies or mass uptake when you're trying to get a clean surface in a QCM. Now another technique that often gets used um, in nanoscale studies and in macroscale studies of materials for that matter is diffraction, x-ray diffraction specifically, also electron diffraction, um, depending on what kind of device you've got. But Remember that X-rays are electromagnetic waves that have very short wavelength, and as we studied in Modern Physics 1, Max von Laue suggested that um, due to their short wavelength that the crystalline lattice of certain materials could act as a three-dimensional diffraction grain for the X-rays because the X-rays are in the same order of size as the spacing in the crystal. And that's kind of shown here in this EM spectrum. You can see down here for the X-rays, you get links um, on the order of a nanometer or less for their wavelength, and that's the order of spacing that you would expect from a crystalline material. Okay, so diffraction gratings have to have spacings comparable to the wavelength of the diffracted radiation, and that's the same for X-rays as parallel planes of atoms.
So um, what you do is you have a source of x-rays and then you collimate them in some way. You need to know the wavelength of the x-ray so you can use a monochromator or you can um, select a certain energy of x-ray by several different techniques. And then you send your x-ray beam out of crystalline material. It'll interact with that uh, material and it'll be diffracted and it'll make a really cool looking pat pattern um, and those became known as a Lowy pattern. And here's some example of some Lowy patterns that occurred for crystals named Beryl and Rubisco and they can be quite beautiful these patterns. Now the Braggs um, was the first and only ever father-son Nobel laureate team but they extended on the work of von Lowy and they constructed an x-ray spectrometer um, and they figured out what the equation was that described x-ray diffraction. And so that equation is basically 2d sine theta is equal to m lambda, as you may remember from physics 3210. So lambda here is the wavelength of the radiation. m is the order, so you can have first order, second order diffraction, so you just um, put in an integer value for what order of radiation was diffracted. And then you have d is your crystalline spacing, and theta is the angle of diffraction, as is shown here um, in the little cartoon there to the right. And this is known as Bragg's Law. And you can use it to figure out the spacing between atomic planes, and it helps you figure out what the crystalline structure of your material is if you come in with a known wavelength of radiation, and then you can measure the diffraction at various angles and swing through various angles, and you can figure out um, what d is. Now, the diffraction pattern is, of course, um, going to be uh, peaks at different wavelengths or different uh, angles there, and that's because there's different crystalline faces that you might want to uh, study and diffract off of. So, say, for example, here, here's a little body-centered cubic crystalline structure, and the x-rays could be diffracted by this plane that cuts diagonally through, or it could be... Uh, cut uh, diffracted by this plane, which is perpendicular to this space here, or it could cut through the whole crystal um, in the way that it's illustrated in the cartoon to the far right. And so all of those would generate different peaks in your diffraction pattern. And then from that, you could figure out what the spacing was between all those different crystalline um, faces, and then uh, kind of back calculate what your structure is supposed to be. Now, what is typically done now is that they have a huge catalog of what the diffraction patterns for a wide array of crystal materials look like, and so um, you compare your diffraction pattern to the catalog, and you can sort of identify the uh, minerals and metals that you might have based from that catalog. And this is what a typical diffractometer might look like where you have your source coming in and then you have a movable um, spectrometer it can swing through a range of angles like so. Now if you had a single crystalline specimen then you'd have to move your sample more but if instead of doing that you grind your specimen up into a powder then um, of course you're going to have little fragments in there that have all kinds of orientations and that means that you won't have to physically swing your spectrometer through as wide an angle range in order to get the full um, information from your spectrum and so that's what people do now. They they grind their specimen into a uh, powder, and then they look at the uh, diffraction pattern coming off that powder. And this is what a typical diffractometer looks like. We have one that looks a lot like this um, on our own campus uh, over in the Rankin Science Building, and it takes 10 minutes or so to get um, a diffraction pattern. Okay, other kinds of spectroscopy um, and particle identification. They can act like a, a compound's fingerprint so that you can identify, hey, there's carbon in this, or this obviously has carbon double bonded to an oxygen in this, and I can tell that from the spectrum. And it can be used kind of like a fingerprint, similar to a diffraction pattern, to identify what your material is. So here I show you a couple of different spectrums. Um, this one is an energy dispersive x-ray spectrum um, here on the left. And then on the right, this is an ultraviolet visible light spectrum. Um, and so they cover different frequencies. And because they cover different frequencies, that means different energies. And you can probe uh, what, the, uh, what the properties of your compound might be based on that, what the chemical identification is. So first let's talk about x-ray, um, x-ray spectra. This is something that you typically find on a lot of scanning electron microscopes and tra transmission electron um, microscopes, especially energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy that's really common on SEMs and TEMs. So 
um, to remind you yet again of a little bit of modern physics one, um, Bohr proposed a pretty simple energy level structure for the hydrogen atom. And basically what he said was these electrons, they sit in energy levels. They sit in discrete levels. It's not a continuous spectrum. And so you can be in your ground state where your energy level quantum number is called n equal to 1, or you can be in your first excited state, n equal to 2, and so on and so forth. And there's an equation that describes for hydrogen what the energy of those energy levels are. And it's that minus 13.6 eV divided by n squared, where n is your energy level quantum number. Now what happens is, when an electron is excited to a higher energy state, it has to absorb that amount of energy and that exact amount of energy in order to make that jump. But if it's in an excited state and it wants to decay back to the ground state, it's going to emit a photon that has exactly that amount of energy of the difference between those two energy levels. Okay, And so that's what happens. Now, if you're in an atom other than hydrogen, you've got um, a nucleus with atomic number Z. Okay, So if you have two protons, for example, Z is equal to two, and so on and so forth. Now, if you have more protons in your nucleus for a neutral atom, you're also going to have more electrons orbiting that nucleus. And that means that that's going to change the equation for the energy levels. Now. It can be more complex than this, um, but the uh, allowed energy levels are basically described by uh, minus 13.6 eV, so that's similar to Bohr's, and now times Z effective squared divided by N squared. Now, Z effective is the effective atomic number, and what that means is that because you're going to have some electrons orbiting your nucleus, that's going to screen some of that charge, depending upon, let's say that you have an electron that's sitting Sitting out here, and then here's your nucleus, but then there's some electrons in between the outermost electron and your nucleus. So you're not going to see the total charge, you're going to see some screened charge or some effective nuclear charge, and that's what that Z effective means. N is still the energy level um, for the quantum number, and then we have another quantum number, L, um, that basically depends upon the eccentricity of the orbit, Okay, and that can help determine what Z effective was. Okay. Now what happens is, you have, say, in an, an SEM, okay, say in a scanning electron microscope, you have an incoming beam of electrons that comes in and smashes into your sample. And those that incoming beam of electrons can have, say, 30 keV of energy, all right? So they're high energy electrons. They come in and they smash into your sample. Well, x rays are going to be emitted from your sample. One kind of X-ray is a continuum, or Bremsstrahlung radiation, which is basically accelerating charges radiate. So when your electrons from your beam come in and slam into the sample, they slow down really fast. And because they're breaking, okay, because they're slowing down, they're decelerating, they're going to emit radiation, and that radiation is going to be X-rays. And that gives you kind of a continuum background of X-ray radiation that's shown here by this hump that kind of decays off, okay? So that's one kind of X-ray that gets emitted from your sample. But there's also the discrete lines that I showed you. There are these peaks, right, labeled here K alpha and K beta, and there can be other um, peaks as well, okay? Now those are what are known as characteristic x-rays, and they are going to have energies that correspond to um, the equation that we showed earlier, that minus 13.6 eV times Z effective squared divided by N squared. Those represent specific transitions of electrons. So what happens there is, let's say you have a bombarding electron that comes in. Well, let's say that one of those electrons knocks loose an electron within the sample. And the electron that it knocks loose is one of those inner shell electrons that's right next to your nucleus, say. Okay, maybe even in the N equal to 1 energy level. It knocks that electron loose and it flies off. It's gone. It's free. Well, there, there's a vacancy then in that N equal to 1 level. So one of the outermost electrons will fall in to fill that vacancy. And when it does that, it emits an X-ray. And that X-ray will have a very specific energy that corresponds to the transition in between whatever energy level it was in and the energy level that it fell into. Okay, And so the X-rays are emitted. They have those characteristic uh, energies. And it can act as a fingerprint for your atom. Okay, so there's an energy that corresponds for an electron in carbon, right, falling from an upper level energy into that n equal to 1 vacant state, and you can identify it, that's carbon, that's the energy that it's always going to be. Okay, so those are characteristic x-rays, and they can be used to identify.
And so it's very useful in a scanning electron microscope, which generates an image which gives you topographic or morphological data. But then you can look at these characteristic x-rays that come off, and you can say, hey, you know, I have carbon there, or I have magnesium in my sample, and I can identify um, what I've got, elemental composition in my sample that way. So here's a picture of one manufactured by the EDAX Corporation there, um, or an EDAX spectrometer sticking off the side of an SEM, and they're very, very typical add-ons to scanning electron microscopes. Okay, typically though, the characteristic x-rays are very high energy, okay? greater than 1,000 eV, and the photons are between 0.01 nanometers and 1 nanometers in wavelength. Now, there, this is a very modern technique. It's used all the time, but it was first observed by Mosley, um, and he observed uh, these uh, spectra, these X-ray spectra with their characteristic peaks in 1913. So what he did was he measured the X-ray spectra of various elements, mostly metals, and he discovered what's known as Mosley's Law, which was the first attempt to put an equation to what these transition energies were or frequencies. So he then related it back to the work of Niels Bohr, and it became an experimental confirmation, if you will, that um, Bohr's model of the atom was on the right track. Um, of course, Bohr's model of the atom wasn't the end-all, be-all answer, and it took quantum mechanics, um, the Schrodinger equation and the work of others, um, <clears throat> to totally model what's going on with the, uh, the atomic structure or the structure of the electrons within um, an element, but uh, Mosley's Law was a big step forward. So what he did was he basically plotted the frequency of the uh, radiation that was emitted from these characteristic x-ray lines and he fit it to an equation and then he related that equation back to Bohr's model for the atom. So basically he proved that the atomic number here was related to the frequency of these x-ray lines that came out for the characteristic x-rays. Okay. Um, and here's some of his plots. Uh, here's his plot from his very first important paper there. Plotting the square root of the frequency um, versus the, uh, the uh, value, okay? So in 1914 it was shown and it's now known um, to be true and you have huge stores of data um, for all the elements and you can use it to figure out what the composition of your material is within a scanning electron microscope or a transition. Uh, transmission electron microscope. So thank you, Mosley. Now, X-rays are higher energy photons, um, and they're associated with those electrons that are tightly bound to the nucleus. Like I said, the um, electron is placed in our, our vacated from an n equal to 1, say, or an n equal to a core shell electron. It's knocked loose, and then a valence electron falls in to fill that. So that's a big energy difference corresponding to an x-ray frequency or wavelength, right? But you also have excitations that can be created in your valence electrons, which are your outer shell electrons. Now, those excitations, the uh, jumps between those energy levels, are going to be lower in energy. And if they're lower in energy, then they're not in the X-ray uh, range anymore of the electromagnetic spectrum. They might be in the UV or the visible or even in the infrared. So there's all kinds of spectroscopies out there that probe different excitations um, for these molecules and atoms. So if you're looking at the valence state electrons, that can tell you a little bit maybe more, give you a little bit more information. It's not just this is a carbon atom anymore, but it might be able to tell you, hey, this is a carbon um, that's double bonded to an oxygen, or this is a carbon that's bonded to a nitrogen, right? And then it becomes a fingerprint, not just for the element, but also um, for the type of bonds it's in or even the type of molecule that it's in. So you can perform a more detailed chemical analysis sometimes using these um, other wavelengths. So one example is um, called UV vis spectroscopy. And there's a, a sort of schematic of what a UV visible light spectrometer does here on the left. So basically, in UV vis spectroscopy, what you've got is a beam of light um, from a visible and or a UV source, ultraviolet source. In this diagram, that is symbolized by the red beam here. And you can see that there's a light source that emits in the ultraviolet and also a light source that emits in the visible. Now those monochromatic beams are um, then split um, into two by this mirror. Um, 
and then they pass through the um, the two samples. But first, of course, I'm sorry. First, you have to select a certain wavelength of radiation, and you do that with a diffraction grating or maybe a prism. Okay, so you want to select one wavelength at a time, and then you want to scan through all the available wavelengths. So for the UV, you would be scanning from say 200 to 400 nanometers is typical in wavelength, then you would scan for the visible from 400 to 800. And you probably just select the energy range that you're interested in. So if you think that you have compound A, and you know that compound A has excitation, say, between 320 nanometers and 450 nanometers, that's the range that you scan um, for your scan, and you might ignore the others. Anyway, so you send your beam through this diffraction uh, grating and maybe through a filter to, uh, to select one energy or a monochromatic beam. And then that gets split into two beams. Now you have your reference beam and you have your sample beam. Okay, so what happens is the, uh, the radiation travels through the sample of interest, which is usually a solution, okay, in a, in a liquid solution. So you have your sample of interest and you mix it into, say, water or something. And then in the other sample, the reference cuvette, you just have plain old water. Okay, so the light travels through those two cuvettes and it's got the same wavelength and then it hits the detector. And what you're looking at is you're looking at how much light at that particular wavelength is absorbed by your sample cuvette as opposed to your reference cuvette, which is supposed to be basically clear and allow all that radiation to just pass straight through. Okay. Now you compare the absorbance of the light of that wavelength um, for each wavelength along the spectrum and then you plot an absorbance spectrum um, which is shown here on the next slide. Okay, so here's your absorbance spectrum and you can see that it plots an intensity for each wavelength. Okay. And then yet again, this is used to act like a fingerprint so that I know that I have this chemical compound right here if I see um, peaks at these particular wavelengths. Okay. So what's plotted here on this absorbance spectrum is actually uh, the, the log of your incident beam I0, which is passing through the reference cuvette, which is supposed to be clear, so that corresponds to all the light making it through, and then divided by what's passing through your sample cuvette. Okay, so if you take the log of that, um, it's going to be equal to epsilon times B times C. Um, here, epsilon is the molar absorptivity of your particular compound. Um, so that's kind of the information that you want to extract, like how much does this particular compound absorb of this wavelength. But it's also dependent upon the path length through the sample. So if you have to pass your light through more sample, of course, more is going to get absorbed. And also the concentration of your compound. Okay, so if you have more of compound X in the water, then more light's going to get absorbed, and that makes sense too. Okay, um, but that's why it's important always to uh, know what the molar absorptivity is, and then have the co uh, concentration which you back out. And you can say, hey, this is what I expect for you know hexane or whatever. So that's UV vis spectroscopy. Now there's a lot of other kind of spectroscopies um, out there available, but they all do kind of hinge on the same principles. There's an excitation created. That excitation can act as a fingerprint for this compound. It can tell you uh, what you've got in there, and you can use it to identify your sample. Now mass spectrometers are another way that you can identify unknown samples. So the principle for mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry is a little different. Basically what they do is they separate ions according to their charge to mass ratios. So what you do is you vaporize your sample um, and you ionize it so that it's a vapor inside of a vacuum chamber that you then pass through. And you pass that beam of ions um, for some mass specs through a velocity selector and then it enters a magnetic field. Um, and the moving charge, of course, is going to uh, curve in response to magnetic field according to Lorentz force law. And then it's going to circle around and that will deflect the path. You measure the deflection of the path of the beam and that can tell you what the charge to mass ratio is. So to remind you what a velocity selector is, that's used in some mass specs, not all mass specs, but some, when you need all of your particles to move with exactly the same velocity. If you remember from your introductory physics, you have the force on a charge is equal to QE when you have an electric field, and it's equal to QV cross B when you have a magnetic field. Now, if you have both, then it's going to be the sum of those two forces. So on a velocity selector, you can have your electric field, and say here it points to the right, and your magnetic field is, say, pointing into the screen here. Well, what that will result for a positive 
positive ion is it'll result for forces um, drawn here from the electric field to the right and from the magnetic field to the left. So if you set um, those two forces equal to one another, QE equals QVB, then you can figure out how uh, fast a particle would be going in order to just go straight through and not curve to one side or to the other depending on which charge would be larger. And that will select a certain velocity out. And the velocity that it will select out is equal to the ratio of the strengths of the electric field to the magnetic field. So V is equal to E over V. And that's what a velocity selector does for you. Then what would happen is it would enter that region where there's only a magnetic field um, and then the ions would move in a semicircle of radius R before striking the detector at some other point. If the ions are positively charged, they would deflect one way, say to the left, and if they're negatively charged, they would deflect in the opposite direction. Okay, and that's basically what a, a mass spec would do. So that's the theory behind a mass spec. Now, there's a whole bunch of different mass spectrometers out there. They have different geometries and they have different ways of selecting the velocity. So some of them might look like this, okay, for example, where you have a gas sample entering here, you have a, a current that filament um, current that's then going to ionize that gas, and then you have a, uh, an accelerator, uh, you apply a voltage that accelerates the ions, and then it passes through a magnetic field region instead of it, you know, entering a uniform huge region where it makes a semicircle, it might just deflect the beam a little bit, and you would measure that deflection. And what would happen then is that the uh, magnetic field would deflect the lightest ions the most, and um, you would get a spread based upon what the mass uh, of the uh, ions were. Okay. Now, how that would work is, let's say that you're going to change the radius of curvature or you're going to change the, the deflection. It would correspond to the Lorentz force law, QVB, equaling to the centripetal acceleration or centripetal force that's being applied, which is mv squared over r. And then you could solve that equation for the charge to mass ratio, q over m. And when you did that, you get v over rb. So yet again, you would know what radius of curvature your beam would have um, within that magnetic field region if you knew what your velocity was. Now, yet again, not all mass specs use velocity selectors. Some of them simply accelerate the ions with a known voltage, and they obtain the speed that way. And what you would do then is you would say that the kinetic energy gained during the acceleration, one half mb squared, would equal to the um, charge times the voltage that you accelerated through. Okay? So that's how mass specs work in a nutshell. All right? So I didn't cover all of the um, special techniques used um, on nanoparticles. I just kind of hit the high points. I do encourage you to read your textbook um, and finish off chapter three and figure out um, what some of those other detection um, methods are used to, uh, um, to figure out what you've got in your sample for nanoscience and nanotechnology. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.